remain standing if you would and take your Bibles or you can actually just take your sermon notes because our scripture for the morning is actually on the top of your sermon notes. Uh, I'm going to be reading it from the Holman, which is on the top of your sermon notes. We're only looking at two verses this morning. Paul writing says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church in Cancrea. So you should welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever matter she may require your help. For indeed, she has been a benefactor of many and of me also. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated and uh, pick up in your text there. We noted uh, last week Paul's plans to go to Rome and then to use Rome kind of as as a stopping point to go from there on to Spain. We talked about how God's plans don't always uh, line up perfectly with our plans. Rather, I should say how our, our, our plans don't always line up with his. And Paul had his expectation of how he thought that was going to happen, but it didn't exactly happen that way. Uh, when Paul winds up in Rome, he is not there uh, of his own free will. Rather, he has been brought there after a couple of years in prison for preaching the gospel. And when he finally arrives, he is in chains. He can receive visitors, but he is not free Uh, to come and go as he would please during his first Roman imprisonment. Uh, So Paul now, concluding the letter, uh, sends greetings and salutations. I'm reminded of what the the, the little kids video, Charlotte's Web. Y'all seen that one? Greetings and greetings and salutations. If you have not watched that with kids or grandkids, you're you're missing a special treat. Um, Of course, if you don't like spiders or Miss Muffet, you might not enjoy it. But in any case, um, he is concluding, and as he speaks to Phoebe, or speaks concerning Phoebe to the church, his remarks concerning Phoebe are not part of greetings and salutations. Actually, it is more of an introduction. In fact, read verses, look at verses 1 and 2 again. Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe. Verse 2, so you should welcome her. Now, Phoebe was from Cancrea. I've heard that pronounced Sincrea. In fact, I listened to Alexander Scorby's narration of that verse this morning, and he said uh, Sincrea. Uh, I don't know if you, I know they make some Bibles that, have, that are self-pronouncing and they make the sound and all of that. Uh, but uh, the letter there is a kappa. It has a K sound. There is actually in the Greek no C. Greek doesn't have a C. Uh, so uh, it, is, it is probably more closely kengkria. That would probably be a little bit more of the, of the sound, like K-E-N-G-K-R-E-E, and then ah, kengkria. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, where was kengkria? Anybody know? Who hadn't read ahead in the notes? It was about eight miles from Corinth. About eight miles from Corinth. So when Paul introduces her, it is likely that she arrived at the same time his letter to the Romans arrived. It is likely that she's the one who delivered the letter. And so as she hands the letter, now now we uh, have something similar to this in our culture, a letter of introduction. Uh, you might go to, to meet someone and they might not know you and you might not know them, but someone who knows both of you might write you a letter of introduction and you could give them the letter, they could read the letter and say, oh, okay, well, you're a friend of his, he recommends you, you're okay with me, what do you need? And so this is likely the situation that in the letter to the, to the Roman church, Paul has brought this Uh, this note, gives this note to her, and she is likely the one who delivered it. Uh, Most theologians agree that Paul is writing from Corinth, and Phoebe, who lives nearby in Cancrea, 
uh, is the one who carries this letter. Now, we'll see in a little bit that there was a close bond between Paul and Phoebe uh, because she helped support him, uh, probably in a, in a similar manner to uh, Lydia, the seller of purple, in Acts chapter 16. Came to the city and she believed, and she was a, was a, a wealthy merchant, a businesswoman, and she had Paul and, and his traveling companions. I can't remember if Luke was in that section or not there in Acts 16. But she had, them, had him come and stay. And so he encouraged her. So the, the verses introduce her. And they charge the church to receive her, uh, welcome her, and then to assist her in whatever she may need help. Some think that there was a specific thing that she needed help with. Some think that, well, basically, just because she has helped others and because that's what she has done, whatever she needs, help her. Uh, that's, that's not clear. But there are some issues raised by this passage that are timely and quite relevant to our church today. You know, you read over that and maybe nothing jumps out at you. How many of y'all have something different? Do any of y'all have something different other than servant? There in uh, verse 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is or who is a servant. Anybody have anything different? Nobody has the NIV today. Nobody has the RSV. Nobody has the NRSV. You have the King James. You have the Holman. You have the ESV. Uh, you have the NAS. Uh, an older RV or the, the ASV, an older ASV, American Standard Version, which isn't as popular anymore because the NAS. All of those have the word servant. But the NIV, the NRSV, which is the, the NRSV is the version most Methodists use, uh, which is an okay, it's a good translation. It's a good translation, as is the NIV. NIV is a little bit more dynamic. Let me explain what that means, okay? When you translate, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I have a cat in my throat. If I were speaking in France, that is the idiom. We say I've got a frog in my throat. So if I were speaking in France, and I don't speak French, and I were, and I just did that, I would say, excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. But if the translator said he has a frog in his throat, everybody would start laughing. They don't know what that means. Okay? What, yeah, what they, would, what they would have to say to translate that is they would have to say, oh, he has a cat in his throat. And I guess that goes back to like a hairball or whatever, I don't know. And, but that is their idiomatic expression. So when we translate from one language to another, we have to determine, do we translate word for word? Or do we go along with the sense and along with the idiom? And let me just suggest to you that perhaps the NIV and the NRSV followed the word-for-word -word translation maybe more precisely. Because you know what word they use there? If you haven't read ahead in the notes, <laughs> they use the word deacon. Now that raises some issues. Phoebe, a deacon or deaconess, at the church in Kenkrea? Now, why does that raise issues? Because we're Baptists. We don't believe in women deacons. Most of us don't anyway. And so that, that's, that's an issue. That's an issue. Now, it's not my task, and I don't particularly enjoy raising matters of controversy that's going to cause you to say, oh, and pick sides or whatever. Uh, we deal with enough of that in life already, don't we? we? We don't need to come here for that. But the fact of the matter is, my plan, my position, my commitment to Scripture is to follow the text. And whatever issues may come up in the text, to deal faithfully with those issues, not to dance around them, not to skip over them, but to deal with them in an appropriate manner, in an appropriate setting. And so there's a little bit of controversy. And there are times when what the Bible says stands 
in stark contrast to what our culture says. And we are beginning to see that more and more in our culture today. And again, it's not a matter of deciding what does the culture say. It's a matter of deciding what we as believers, what will our response be in light of the fact that the Word of God says this and our culture says something else. How many of y'all uh, do emails or get, get, do Facebook or any of that kind of stuff? I noticed someone posted on, someone posted on Facebook a picture of, I think it was a Jack Russell Terrier. And the subtitle was, Bruce Jenner's cat, or Caitlin, or whatever. Somebody, you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, just a thought, this is not in your notes. They, they call that gender reassignment. Have you heard that term? Yep. Gender reassignment. Basically, the statement is, I got the wrong body. Who I am was assigned the wrong body. But the interesting thing is that most of the people who, who are using that term and who are arguing for that don't believe in God. And so how can they say God assigned me the wrong body when they don't believe in God? But that's the term, gender reassignment. That's the term. Uh, and, and where we are, and we're not far, probably by the end of the summer, we will have a ruling from the Supreme Court on gay marriage. And it is fully expected, I heard as high as a 6-3 decision, in favor of stating that the right for a man to marry a man and the right for a woman to marry a woman is a basic foundational human right. And we cannot deny human rights. I just expect that's what's going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, no. But the scripture has defined that, and that's always been very, very clear. There's some other things in scripture that are not quite as clear, but a man marrying a man and a woman marrying a woman, that's clear. Uh, marriage was designed to be between a man and a woman. That was God's original plan. That's clear, no doubt about that. What we cannot do is we cannot reinterpret the Bible in light of what a particular generation may believe because culture changes. And so we cannot shift based on the shifting mores, the values of a sinful culture. Doesn't matter what the culture says. We've got to take a stand on what the text itself says. It's not my job, not your job, to reinterpret Scripture in such a manner as to bring it into line with our culture. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are a lot of ministers, if I could use that term, or preachers, or I'm not sure exactly what to call them, who believe that they must take the Bible and make it relevant to our culture today. Now, generally, I think the NIV is an okay translation. It's a little bit more fluid, a little bit more dynamic, a little bit less word for word than, say, the NAS, but it does read s smoother and it flows smoother. Uh, of all the translation besides the King James, which is the one I memorized and learned, the f my favorite one right now is, is the Holman. Uh, it's just, it's just a, a very accurate, precise translation, and I think they hit the balance well between idiomatically and, and translating word for word. But how many of y'all have heard of the TNIV? Today's New International Version. Who's heard of it? Well, we don't beat that drum. We might beat up that drum, but we're going to beat up that drum just a little bit today. Today's NIV was a revision of the NIV to make it, here's the term, gender neutral. So sometimes they refer to God as he, and sometimes they refer to God as she. Now, if your God is Mother Earth, that's okay. But if your God is Yahweh, Elohim, the creator of heaven and earth, he very clearly defines himself in masculine terms. And when he came, he came as a man. It is not correct to pray to God our mother. And have y'all ever been in one of, the, one of these ecumenical type things and heard someone say something like that? 
I mean, it just makes my hair stand on end. It just <laughs> irritates me. It just, it just irritates me. It really does. It re- just, anyhow, all the nuts. In any case, it is not our job to reinterpret Scripture. Our job is to do this, okay? Our job is to love God, to love one another, and to love the lost. That is our job. Now, I would direct your attention, I think it might have rolled over onto page two, to the paragraph that starts with our job. Go to about the middle of that, and I want you to follow this, okay? Bottom of page one. I want to, if you see Psalm 33, 12, look right above that, because I want you to track with me real close on this. I wrote the words out carefully. It is not our job, it's not our role to reform our society into a nation, quote unquote, whose God is the Lord. From Psalm 3312. Psalm 3312 says this Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That sounds good. I think it would be great if our nation worshiped God. I'm all about that. I am proud of the Christian heritage, the foundation, the principles of morality, of truth, of right and wrong upon which our nation was built. But God did not choose this nation. God, I believe, has blessed this nation. Because for a long time, as a nation, we chose him. Those days are gone. Starting in the mid-60s when the Supreme Court says, you can't pray in school. And it went downhill from there. It is not our job to try to turn our culture and our political environment back to a nation whose God is the Lord. That passage relates to Israel. In fact, the rest of that passage, Psalm 33, 12, says this, Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for our inheritance. Now, let me say, as citizens, I have no problem at all voting out the liberals as a citizen. As a citizen, I have no problem at all calling and whining and griping and complaining and and using my vote or whatever to try to shift back to some of the conservative values upon which this nation was founded. But our role as believers is to love God, to love one another, and to love the lost. And we must never confuse that it is, it is because it is not the task of the church to redeem our society. Because bottom line, our society, if you'll pardon me, our society is going straight to hell. It is. Read the book of Revelation. That's where it's going, along with anyone who does not trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. It is a mistake to make it our mission to try to turn that around. Okay? Just some thoughts on that. Proclaim the gospel to everyone, not redeem the nation's politics. Now, I'm going to come back to our text. Look back at verse 1. I I meandered and I meddled maybe just a little bit that meandering meddling preacher 16 1 here's what it says i commend you commend to you our sister phoebe she's not a member of the church they didn't know her she wasn't from rome a little bit later he'll speak to somebody says you know them and they're there and tell them this and tell them that and encourage them support them help help them give them thanks He'll, he'll do that with some of the others that the church knew but they did not know phoebe So again, as we already mentioned, she's a member of the body of Christ, but it's likely that no one in Rome knew her. Again, as she arrives at the same time as the letter, most likely to understand that she probably delivered the letter. letter. And and a little bit as we get to verse 2, we'll we'll note that she was a wealthy member both of the the, uh, Kincrean church and probably also of the society in Kincrea because of the word that is used to describe her, the word patron there in uh, verse 2. Think about this. Within the body of Christ, and you've heard me say this before, within the body of Christ, within the body of believers, we're the body of Christ, there are no strangers. There are are only brothers and sisters that we haven't met yet. When someone comes into this place for the first time, 
if they're a believer, we ought to have an immediate link with them. Because they're family. In fact, those who put their faith and trust in Christ, it's a tighter bond than blood family. Because we'll spend all eternity with them. It is not necessarily true that we'll spend all eternity with our family. Some of y'all say, phew, thank God. No. But <clears throat> the reality is family members, even close family members that we love and that we're dear to, unless they know the Lord Jesus Christ, they are not destined to the same place we are. One of the hardest things that I do as a preacher, one of my most difficult tasks, is to try to comfort a family when a loved one has passed and there is uncertainty regarding whether or not they were believers. It's a tough thing to do. It's the toughest thing I do. All I can say is God is just, God is righteous, God is good, God is loving, and he will do what is right. Usually in a situation where there is some question as to whether or not a person is a believer, I don't stress real heavily, although I do stress that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and if we trust him we're saved. I don't stress real heavily. If you don't trust him, you're destined for hell. You're destined for the lake of fire. I don't usually stress that side of it too much because it does not bring comfort to the family. Those are tough issues. Those are tough issues. Now think about this. Think about the reality of this. Sure, we heard the gospel, but who was it who had to bring the truth of the word of God home to our hearts? Who was it who had to draw us to Christ? Was it our own nature? Would we have come on our own nature? Were we good people better than our neighbors? They didn't come, but we did because we're basically good. No, it's God's grace that draws us. It's the Holy Spirit who convicts and draws us. And it's only by his grace. It is only by his mercy that we respond, respond positively. So again, it's not about who's better. Okay. But it's a tough thing to try to deal with a family where there is a, a pretty good chance the person who died was not a believer. I, I don't have near as much to say. There just aren't words. And when I speak with a family in that situation, it's, it's a tough thing. Uh, it's much easier to bury someone's child who was a believer. I cannot even imagine the despair that we would have felt had it not been for our steadfast confidence in the fact that Matthew had trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew the Lord. And so it was not goodbye, although every fiber of our being cried out that it was, and it sure felt like it. But it was only, we'll see you later. But for a believer who loses an unbelieving loved one, it's goodbye, and that's a tough thing. But within the family, the body of Christ, we have an eternal bond. I don't know if you thought about that. How many of y'all, and we've talked about this before, let me just talk about it again as long as we're here. How many of y'all have siblings, brothers or sisters? Uh, there's a passage in the Psalms, I think it is. Maybe it's in Proverbs. Psalms or Proverbs. I think it's in Proverbs. It says this, a brother is born for adversity. <laughs> brother is born for adversity. When I first read that, I thought, well, that's why you fight with your brother. They're born for adversity. <laughs> that's not the sense of the passage. How many of y'all, you think of, you know, brothers you remember growing up, you think, that's what that means. It means we're going to fight. We're destined to fight. That's what I thought. That's not what it means. What it means is a brother is, is born to come and stand beside you in time of adversity. You don't go through the adversity of alone. Uh, uh, adversity alone. Your brother is to come beside you. And that is our task, is to come beside one another. We are to comfort one another. And that's the, mean, that's the basic meaning of the word, parakaleo, come alongside and comfort. And that's also the word for the Holy Spirit, paraclete, one who comes alongside and comforts. So we're to come alongside and do that. And that's a bond that we are to have. We're to be together and we're to comfort one another in whatever the circumstances are. So as we come back to this, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant or deacon, as some say. 
Now, this is one of those difficult passages. We do a couple of things when we come to difficult passages. So just kind of listen, pay attention on this, okay? Sometimes we come to a difficult passage, and when we read that, if, if I had a version that said, which is a deacon of the church, and I, I don't have one of those, but if I, had, if I was reading from one of those, I would read it like this. Uh, and we commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a church which is at Kencrea. <laughs> just kind of mumble past that. Or, or read it real fast. We, we do that sometimes. I've done that. I'll tell you, I've done that. If somebody want to deal with it, I just kind of just, or I read it real fast and I don't ever say anything. And I kind of glance up to say, did they catch that? You know, I hope they miss that because I'm not going to talk about it. All right. Or we tend to reinterpret scripture in terms of what's comfortable with our culture. We define it based on how we read it. We read the Bible and we filter the Bible through the lens of our subculture. And when I say subculture, I mean the particular brand of Christianity that we belong to. Now, there are some churches who think that you ought to have women pastors and women deacons and women evangelists and all that. Okay? We happen to hold to a more literal interpretation of Scripture and we would differ with that. But don't misunderstand me. Women are critical in the church. They are key players in the church. Paul did not hate women. Some say Paul was a misogynist, M-Y-S, and basically he hates women, and that's not the case at all. In fact, in this salutation and greeting and the closing, he mentions eight women. In the genealogy of Jesus, in Matthew's gospel, there are four women who were mentioned who were not Jews. Matthew focuses on Jesus as the king of the Jews, the Messiah of Israel. And he mentions four women who weren't Jews. And at least three of them were of kind of shady background. You can go back and look at it there in Matthew chapter 1. Uh, Tamar, Rahab, um, and um, Bathsheba, and also there's Ruth. And some suggest that her behavior at the threshing floor kind of made her on the edge. But three of them for sure were, and they're Gentiles in the lineage of Christ. So, you know, we, we, we come to some of those things. So, anyhow, these were the eight women at the end. So, Paul, Paul didn't, women are critical. Uh, go back, let me see, I didn't, I didn't write it down in my notes. Let me see if I can find the passage in Acts real quick. I think it's in 16 or 15. Um, Paul at, uh, with, at Lydia's house. Uh, let's see if I can find it real quick. Uh, Lydia, we mentioned her earlier. She was a, a seller of purple. Uh, and verse, it's in 1614. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple. Now, that's like, uh, you know, we don't understand that culturally today. A seller of purple is like saying, well, what do you do? I, I sell red. You mean you work for Crayola? No, no, I sell red. <laughs> purple was probably a purple dye. It was very, very expensive because it was made from the blood of a particular type of a, of, a, of a caterpillar. And it was rare, and it was extremely expensive, and it was, a, it was a beautiful dye. That's why purple was a color of royalty. I don't know if you were aware of that. Purple is a color of royalty. When we um, decorate the cross for Easter, we put the purple up there. It's a purple robe mocking Jesus. They probably, it's believed that they put a purple robe on him. Oh, you're royalty, you're the king, and... And they, they were mocking him. Purple, the color of royalty, because it's so expensive, at least back then. Today, you know, we can wear purple and people think we're rich. Uh, any, but, but anyhow, that's what she was. But she was very successful. So in Acts chapter 16, it says she worshipped God, 1614, she worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Interesting, her husband's not mentioned. When she was baptized and her household, now whether that means her husband had died and she had kids and grandkids or whether it simply means the servants of her household is not clear. 
But in any case, it says, She besought us, saying, If ye have judged me faithful in the Lord, come to my house and abide there. And she constrained us. I got a big house. I got lots of food. I got servants. Come stay with me. You and your traveling companions, I'll put you up. When Paul says at the end of chapter 16, Romans 16, verse 2, here's what he says. That you receive her in the Lord as become of the saints, that you assist her in whatsoever business she has need of. She has been, uh, the King James says, um, has, has an old word, but it's a minister, a servant, uh, a helper uh, of many and myself also. So Phoebe was in that, in that same realm. All right, now, servant deaconess. It's from the same word, the Greek word diakone, feminine of that. The question is not which word is used, the question is how is it used. If I were to say to you, who is Jack? How is Jack used in that sentence? Who is Jack? Or where, where's Jack? All right, but I'm speaking about a what? A man, a person, right? Okay, on the other hand, if I've got a flat tire, I would say, open the trunk and get me the... We understand from the way it's used that I'm speaking about the car jack, right? Not the person jack, okay? The word diakonos could be used to refer in a general sense to a servant. And I think that's the proper way to take it, okay? But there are some who say, no, it's a technical use. I tend to lean toward 1 Timothy chapter 3 when it says, let the deacons be the husband of one wife, that that is one of the prohibitions that says deacons should be men, okay? Some go a little bit farther down in the verse, this is likewise also the wives, and they say that, well, that's the deaconesses, it refers to them. But one thing is clear. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul makes it clear, and I've got the quote here in your notes, and 1 Timothy 2 is in your note. 1 Timothy uh, 2, 12, here's what he says. This is somewhere on page 3. 1 Timothy 2, 12, and it should be read. Here's what Paul says. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. Holman reads this way. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over the man. And what that means is that a woman should not be in a position in a church where she authoritatively declares the word of God to men. That does not mean that women are less important. It does not mean that women cannot understand the word of God. In fact, it doesn't even mean that some women are better Bible teachers than many men. I mean, K. Arthur, tremendous Bible teacher. Okay? But... As I understand the words of Paul, she should not be in a church position teaching men. It's, it's just a matter of the authority, and Paul talks about that. We're not going to do all of that now. It's not a matter of what we're comfortable with, though. It doesn't matter what we're comfortable You can take a frog. I, I've never had frog legs. I know. I, I, here I live in North Georgia. We've got a pond. Andrew gigs frogs in my pond, but I have never had frog legs. People say, yeah, I know. People say it tastes like chicken. And when they say that, I say, well, I'll just have the chicken. It tastes like frog. Like frog. It tastes like frog. Yeah, well, anyhow. So in any case, all right, uh, you know, you can take a frog and you can put him in a pan of cool water. And if you raise the temperature of that water gradually enough, he'll begin to think, oh, this, is, this feels good. This is warm. I'm getting warmer. This feels wonderful. This is so warm, I feel really good. In fact, he'll say, this is so warm, I don't feel so good anymore. In fact, my skin's starting to change color. But they won't jump out and be up till the point where it's too late for them to jump out. And the point is, if you do something gradually enough, people can warm up to the idea. Culturally, we can't do that. You know what the question is? The question comes back to Romans 4.3. We won't turn to it. We did that almost a year ago now. Chapter 4, Romans 4, 3. The question is, what about Abraham? Was Abraham justified by faith or works? Well, what was it? Faith or works? And we get James and Paul, we're not going to get into all that. But you know what Paul asks in verse 3 of Romans chapter 4? Here's what he says. For what saith the... What saith the scripture? And that's the test. What does God say? 
And that's the reason why I try to be so diligent to give you notes. I know sometimes I miss. I'm sorry. So you can check it out in the book. It's not what does the preacher say. Because it really doesn't matter what the preacher says. Unless what the preacher says is what God says. And then it doesn't matter what the preacher says. It matters what God says. The preacher just repeated it to you. And that is the preacher's task is to declare and proclaim unto you the word of God. So whatever you do with deacon or servant, and I'm not going to debate that. I have an opinion on that. What is clear is that a woman cannot be in a position of authority over a man in the church, nor is she to authoritatively teach men. That doesn't mean that they don't have some things that if we'd pay attention to, we'd maybe be a little bit smarter sometimes. Okay, But it does mean that she's not to be in an official capacity of teaching the word of God to men. What is clear, Phoebe was a dedicated servant of the church. Phoebe was a dedicated servant of other believers and even of the Apostle Paul. The word that's used there is the word patron. Only time it's used in this sense in the New Testament. But Phoebe is described as a patron. We, we use the word similar today. We say so-and-so is wealthy and he is a patron of the arts or a patron of the library or a patron of whatever, patron of the, you know, the local restoration of the theater. All right, what that means is that they financially support. And she was a supporter of other believers. They had needs. I want to close with this thought, okay? We all have stuff. I saw a bumper sticker on the back of a Porsche driving up 400. 10, 15 years ago, here's what it said. He who dies with the most stuff wins. Seriously. On the back, it, was, it was the high-end Porsche. Turbo, Carrera, racing, whatever. He who dies with the most stuff wins. And that's the, I know that's the philosophy of his life. The person's life. My question is, wins what? And I immediately go back to the, to the scripture which says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? See, if you win everything else but you lose your own soul, what difference does it make? Think about this. Everything we have is only loaned to us. Nothing is really ours. Because you know what? We're going to leave it one day. We might leave it to our kids, to our grandkids, to our... Okay, but it's not ours. We are not going to take it with us. Okay? But you know what? If we invest in the right things, if we invest in people, we can take them with us. That's a thought. Okay? But Phoebe understood that her stuff was just stuff, and she understood that it was loaned to her for a time for her to use and to manage in a way that brought glory to God and that helped the saints. And I would leave you with that thought. What stuff you have ain't yours. We don't talk a whole lot about this word. A lot of Baptists talk a whole lot about this word. In fact, they talk about this word when they pass something by you and the men stand by there to see what you put in? No, I, don't, I shouldn't say that. What's the word that they often use? And it means 10%. We have this idea, well, God gets the tithe. But my main objection to that is it leaves us with the concept that the other 90% is mine. I give God the tithe and I can do whatever I want with the rest of it. Not really. The reality is it's all his. We referred to the offering Paul took last week. We didn't get to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul says, let me tell you about the brothers in Macedonia. They were so compassionate. They were so desirous of helping the saints back at Jerusalem. That was last week. We didn't have time to get into that. But here's what he said. He says, they gave above and beyond their ability. Did I mention that last week? In fact, they gave so much, Paul says, that they had to beg me to take the offering because I said, you guys can't give this much. I can't take that. You know what he said? He said they first gave of themselves to God. If you give your heart to God, everything else will follow. May we be like Phoebe, understanding that what we have 
is for him and for the benefit of our brothers and sisters in Christ. May we help as he has enabled us to. May we pray. Father, I thank you for your love and your grace. I thank you for Phoebe. I thank you for the example that she is. Her love, her compassion, she helped Paul. She helped other saints in need as they came through Kincrea. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to have that same attitude to serve you first and then to serve one another. We thank you for your love and for your grace and for your mercy in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.